Hi, I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. And it's Tuesday, September 25th. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. And now we're going to hear some local headlines. Hi, and I'm going to start with some events. And the first one is on November 3rd is the Translating Identity Conference at UVM. You can go online to register for this. October 1st, Montpelier Senior Center, sponsored by Rainbow Umbrella, is an evening with the liaisons. Come, talk to us about needs, things that work well, how we can be better advocates. Saturday was Bisexuality Awareness Day. Yes. Which some people knew. 40% of our community identifies being bisexual, but only 28% of those are out. What are we doing so they do or do not feel supported? Representative Diana Gonzalez is going to be taking on a new role, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Bailey Howe Library at UVM. Maybe it's time for a change in their name. We'll definitely talk about that. And during Anne's interview, look for some themes. Saturday, fire truck pull up Church Street in Burlington, teams of 12 to benefit Outright Vermont. You should be seeing some lovely photographs. They raised $72,000. That is Good amazing. Good for them. You can start doing early voting as of last Friday. Definitely you can do it now. People who live in Montpelier, look on the ballot. There will be an initiative to allow non-citizens to vote. And this was the same issue that was recently deb debated by the Winooski City Council. We'll talk a little bit about their decision and what it was based on. Since this election season, not only is there a record number of women running for public office, there's a record number of out LGBTQ candidates. We'll talk about some to watch. And then there is my, I gave you fake news. <coughs> I gotta make it better. And we'll talk a little bit about two stories in particular from the last show and where I led you astray. Trivia, front page. Out in the mountains, they do not know the answer. October 1986, the article was about the Vermont Republican Party and an initiative they just removed from their platform. What might it have been? Mm. Mm. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about some bullying in red versus blue districts. Yeah. And some interesting results. Mm. Well, I would like to talk about several matters, including the fact that the Australian Senate has passed a motion to tackle conversion therapy. A Lithuanian artist has launched an LGBTQ rainbow flash mob after an arson attack. Kenya judge lifts ban and rules lesbian film can be submitted to the Oscars. That's Rafiki that we have talked about. I have some entertainment news from China. South Korea and the LGBT community, I'd like to follow up on a story I didn't get to last time about the protest march and other matters in Korea. Belgrade gay pride participants call for a law on same-sex marriage. Romania will hold a referendum on changes to the Constitution that could effectively permanently ban gay marriage. The violent death of a well-known gay activist in the Greek capital of Athens. And the Queen's cousin, Lord <laughs> Ivar Mountbatten, marries his new husband after being given away by his ex-wife, <laughs> ceremonially, and maybe. <coughs> With a satin lapels. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I have a picture. And it was very cute. Okay. Okay, and I have, first of all, and also a, a mistake that I made um, on the last show, and I got this information from our friend Gail, who is a um, avid fan and watches the show all the a time. A loyal viewer. Yes. 
So she informed me that Jenna Wolf and Stephanie Gosk started their relationship in 2010 and gave birth to their second baby girl, not their first, as I re reported in the last show. So thank you, Gail. Colorado makes history as the first state to issue intersex birth certificates. Buffalo Catholic Charities has to <laughs> has packed up and left town. Well, they're gonna leave town soon uh, because apparently Buffalo has a non-discrimination uh, law and they would have to uh, give foster children and uh, adoptions. So they don't wanna do that. So they're leaving, they're packing up and leaving Buffalo. Anne's hometown. What an embarrassment. <laughs> but it's, it's just a city ordinance, it's not a state? It's city, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Abram Devine in 2018 was NCAA champion, um, and he's come out as gay in an interview with Swimming World magazine, and we have a picture of him, and also we have a picture in the beginning of the uh, uh, CNN couple with their two children. Um, it seems that Billie Jean King now owns part of the L.A. Dodgers. Really? Yes. In August, the district has suspended Steve Wellendorf, the principal of Beaver County High School, the LGBT proponents of Massachusetts ballot to overturn transgender project protections are running an ad that suggests the 2016 law puts women's lives at risk. Gay Rodman, writer, um, election in Texas, a love story. Dean Cain slams LGBT activist intolerance to anti-gay hate groups. An LGBT group sues the governor to stop a drag queen story hour. Janelle Ortiz was a Latinx transgender woman who was killed by the alleged serial killer two weeks ago, uh, carried out by an intelligence supervisor for the U.S. Border Patrol, Juan David Ortiz. This <coughs> is the 21, 21st transgender murder in 2018. You, Vice President Mike Pence has the honor, or dishonor, this weekend, he addressed the annual Values Voters Summit, mm -hmm. hosted by the Family Research Council, an anti-LGBT group. He is the first vice president to ever do so. So, Ugh. and Cinema Diverse at LGBT Film Festival in Palm Springs, The Long Road to Freedom, the advocates celebrate its 50 years to nearly sold out audience, so that's my. And this was also the anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Was it? September 20th. Hmm. There you go. F useless things floating. <laughs> it's from reading the Duberman <laughs> book, which we'll talk about. Oh, at yes. Some, which we'll talk about at some point. Deanna Gonzalez, who we have interviewed several times on this show, who is a progressive legislator from Winooski, has a new job as Director of Leadership Programs at the Equality Federation. Equ and, of no and why this is truly of note, the Equality Federation was founded in 1997 as an umbrella group of state-based LGBTQ advocacy organizations, and they specifically look at trying to provide advocacy, organizational development, and leadership development which is one of the things that we have talked about on this program about how do we do outreach to our community? How do we bring people together? How do we come up with common causes and set a work progress in place? Deanna, I've got plans for you. <laughs> Bailey Hile Library, UVM. Guy Bailey, it was named after him because of his significant donations to the library but he was also one of the largest private fundraisers for the eugenics project here in Vermont. 
Was that in the 40s and 50s? You it think, was or? in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Okay. Because it kind of mirrored what might have been happening in Germany with uh, yeah. how do we do better breeding pedigrees. And that's pulled directly <sighs> from the eugenics language. Who they targeted here in Vermont, First Nation Abenaki, French Canadian, those people of bad heredity, handicapped, or disabled, and those people with dusky complexions. <laughs> and he was instrumental in passing the 1931 Sterilization Act hmm. that was enacted here in Vermont. So, yeah, I think it's time to consider Taking renaming the down. library. Yeah. Early voting, you know, as I said, one of the initiatives non -ballot, uh, on the ballot is non-citizen voting. Winooski, they had <coughs> quite a debate, <coughs> and it was the city council, and they decided not to put it on the ballot, not to pursue it by a three to two vote. Yeah. And some of it was based, you know, from some of the accounting on their concern about what the feds might do looking at what had happened to Burlington, Montpelier, and the state of Vermont when the Department of Justice was looking at pulling funds because we wouldn't play with immigration and ICE. We wouldn't report names. Was this going to make them a target? So and I have to just interrupt and strenuously object to that point of view. Being afraid of Donald Trump will not save us. Absolutely not. No. So, and then I'll come back to, we'll talk a little bit about how many LGBT candidates we got running this year. And you know what? And I who we might want to watch. There's three gay Republicans running in Connecticut. Yes. So there's, that's there's, kind of there is a hundred and one out LGBT candidates yeah. running for state legislators. We have seven of them. Yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> so what you got? I've got Australia. Um, Again? <laughs> mm -hmm. The new Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is a little bit of a deplorable. Um, he's made a string of anti-LGBTQ comments. Last week he said he would not get involved in outlawing gay conversion therapy. It's just not an issue for me, and I'm not, not planning to get engaged in it. Luckily, there are a lot of outspoken leaders who are in support of, of banning gay conversion therapy. And on Tuesday, the 11th of September, when we last taped, uh, the Senate passed a motion to tackle the rise in LGBT conversion therapy in the country. So the good people won. Um, Lithuania, uh, this artist has whom you see pictured before you with his flash mob. He's the blonde person named Romas Zabaruskas. Um, he's a filmmaker. He was asked to remove the rainbow flag from his balcony. Um, he refused and a fire was set inside his apartment. It damaged uh, the apartment of his neighbors and is being investigated as a possible hate crime. In response, he has teamed up with human rights advocate Tomas Ilya to launch a rainbow flash mob raising thousands of euros overnight to buy 500 more flags <laughs> and distribute them for free across Vilnius. The pair also called on others to hang rainbow flags from their own windows and balconies and share the photos. So their <laughs> <laughs> rainbow flags are everywhere now around, in and around Vilnius. Good for him. And yes. Uh, in Kenya, we have a little bit of marginal good news. I. I think I reported, in fact, I showed you a clip of the lesbian film Rafiki that uh, means friend in Swahili, um, and it means friend, and it was banned due to its homosexual storyline. Uh, given its premiere at the Cannes Festival, the critics lauded it, um, and were hoping it was you know, the filmmaker was trying to submit it for the Oscars for the best foreign film. Uh, the deadline was September 30th. Uh, the real deadline, however, was this September 23rd, 
because the rules state it must be screened for at least seven days before the deadline in its home country. And it has been banned in its home country. Um, director so where's Onuru the kids going to? Kayahu um, sued Kenya and um, particularly the Kenya Film Classification Board uh, and they in April had said it should not be um, shown in Kenya, no, anybody renting it will be imprisoned, um, sodomy is a crime, but in this instance a judge has chosen to lift the ban for seven days so it can be shown um, and submitted to the Academy Awards. Gay themes and practice, or the practice of homosexuality did not begin with Rafiki, the judge said. I'm not convinced that Kenya is such a weak society that its moral foundation will be shaken by seeing such a film. Yeah. It began to be screened on the 22nd of September. As we recall from when we saw the clip in April, the plot sees best friends Kina and Ziki wish for something different than becoming good Kenyan wives. Despite the political rivalry between their families, the girls resist and support each other to pursue their dreams in a conservative society. When love blossoms between them, the two will have to choose between <laughs> happiness and safety. Yeah. And the uh, filmmaker said she was pressured by Kenya to make, it, to make the characters remorseful about their oh, homosexuality. She refused, it was banned, and now it's, the ban has been lifted so that it can be in the Oscars. 1950s all over again. I'm Remember? telling you. Yes. Okay, do well, I? Yes, you have to. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> She's on it today. I know, I know. Look out. She always is. Um, Alexander, is, I think it's Carbell Ildo, 40, was chased by the Miami police after he allegedly raped oh. and robbed a gay man. He pulled out an AK-47 and fired at police who were pursuing him. The raped man said he was pistol whipped, raped, and had money and jewelry stolen. Um, and so uh, that was uh, Carbadillo was killed in the um, fire. None of the police were so. Um, in August, the district has, has suspended Steve Wellendorf, the principal of Beaver County High School. His supporters rallied, pushing for him to be reinstated. Some took it further, including Luke Baradelli, a former member of the Beaver City Council and alumni of the high school, with the allegation that su the suspension of Wellendorf support because he was um, he was a Christian and he didn't want the Christian student group uh, to be in the school. Uh, the Beaver County Times, Burradelli alleged last week that there was a toxic culture in the school and that Roe had targeted people who are involved in Christian youth life, a group he said Wellendorf is associated with. During public comment on Monday's meeting, Baradelli asked the board to reinstate Wellendorf. He did not ask the board not to renew Rose's contract, as he had previously announced he would do. At Monday night school board meeting, the board solicitor clarified that the suspension was not tied to intolerance, but district policies. The reason will remain confidential. So what happened? He was, why was he suspended? Well, he was suspended. He, they said they, they're not going to say it was because it was a personal matter, but it had nothing to do with that, you know, because he was alleging that um, he would, this group was alleging that he was fired because he was, a, he was, he was Christian. Oh. Okay. And this principal, and that he supported a Christian um, group. A youth group. In the school, in the school. And he was fired for I don't know what reasons, but, um, you know, he, uh, 
he's protesting the he's protesting that the firing the firing th th so this is another one of those religious freedom restoration yeah. you're coming after me because I'm Christian yeah. and and because I support Christian values Christian oh. values mm. and the LG this is really kind of creepy because the LGB proponents of Massachusetts ballot to overturn transgender protections are running an ad that suggests a 2016 law puts women's lives at risk. In the ad, there is an obvious cisgendered male entering a locker room as a woman is unbuttoning her blouse. The music in the background is threatening and there is heavy breathing. The law puts our privacy at risk, the female narrator <coughs> con concludes. It just goes too far. A new poll in Massachusetts, however, shows that 73% say they favor keeping the law in place. We will have an update on this after the election That's in November when this, is, this initiative is on the ballot in Massachusetts. And uh, it doesn't really show much chance of... Um, here's another creepy story. Well, can we... So the law is... It's on the ballot in November it's, okay. it's to take away the, the, the uh, bathroom bill. And it has a little choice of passage. It has little, 73% 70, okay. of people in Massachusetts. Say the law like, is fine the way it is. They like to okay. leave the law the because way it is. Because there's no okay. credible evidence that supports you're okay. at risk. This Thanks. is another really creepy thing, elections in Texas. It's Texas. Texas. <laughs> I watched the debate. It was pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. Although there's an, a new thing about O'Rourke is that, you know, he, he had a D, DUI. Yeah. And he says he didn't run away, but there's evidence he did. So there's really some oh issues mm. in um, he ran from the scene, apparently. And mm -hmm. so there's some issues there. But this is a whole nother thing. Texas Republicans are so desperate, they are insinuating some Democrats are cross-dressers. With pictures. <laughs> The Texas GOP has recently made it clear they intend to persist in promoting the various lies that support transphobic bathroom bill, and they have taken it to a higher level by claiming that some cisgender Democrats running for office are perhaps transgender. The Tea Party original and GOP candidate for Texas agriculture, Sid Miller, called O'Rourke a sweet little thing in a flower dress. O'Rourke apparently was once in a punk band in which they all wore flower dresses as a spoof, mm -hmm. but they're putting this picture everywhere. And the other person is Kulkarni, and he's running in Texas District 22, which is now held by anti-trans crusader Peter Olson. And apparently he did some performance at, um, what is that um, in Nitton? Where they all go to the desert, something man. Burning Man. Burning, Burning man. man, yeah. So they found a picture from that it was taken at Burning Man where he's dressed in this regalia. The outfit. Yeah, and so they're trying to say now that, um, you know, so pretty creepy stuff to be. Yeah. Anyway, so locally. So following that up, we have 218 out LGBT candidates running across the country. 13 of them are running for federal office, one of whom we'll be watching in our backyard. Chris Pappas, coming out of New Hampshire, first house district. He would be the first openly LGBTQ New Hampshire resident voted to Congress. All right. There are four open candidates running for governor. Oh my, one might be Christine Holquist, who was just endorsed by Bernie Sanders. I know, I saw and that. And Joe Biden. Well, it, that's right, since yeah. our last broadcast, Joe Biden stepped up and said, this is who I would vote for. So in the category of, I didn't really mean to lead you astray, <laughs> Texas, Florida, they're so interchangeable. <coughs> it was Alex Jones accusing Marco Rubio, not Ted oh. Cruz, of selling out the conservative journalists. And for those people who aren't quite familiar with Alex Jones, he's the person who started the conspiracy theory that Sandy Hook never happened, those children never existed, and it was all staged. Deplorable. <laughs> so, and, and the other story was 
about perjury before Congress, I didn't mean to say that 45 Jr. had pled guilty. It was that one of the conversations were those people who were part of the Mueller investigation who were, had already testified before Congress and for whom the testimony in the Mueller investigation had showed that, oh my, you really did perjure yourself before Congress, such as the testimony from the people who have pled guilty. And then the question was, okay, so will they prosecute this? It's one of those convoluted processes where Congress would need to report it to the FBI that they think perjury had occurred. The FBI would need to investigate. The FBI would then need to turn it over to the Department of Justice to determine if they were going to prosecute. And oh my, that would be an administrative decision. <laughs> the last time this happened was John Poindexter in the Iran-Contra affair. Uh -huh. And he ended up, his perjury conviction was overturned because they determined that when he testified with immunity before Congress on a piece of this, he influenced some of the witnesses who later testified against him, and therefore he did not get a fair process. And just a little side note, Congress doesn't investigate their own perjury cases because they're the ones creating the law. It would be, you know, a conflict to then enforce them. So, Ooh. Oy. so what you got, Quack? Oh, I got plenty. I know you do. Well, <laughs> let's go to um, China, if we could. I'd like to show you a picture of a uh, vocalist named Dua Lipa, who's British. Um, and her ancestry is Albanian, and her family is from Kosovo. Um, they left Kosovo and uh, moved to Britain for a while when she was born. Uh, she's praised her fa fans' bravery. She had a concert in Shanghai, and some of her fans were removed for waving rainbow flags. They were also removed for dancing. They were supposed to sit <laughs> quietly in their seats, apparently. And um, so Dua Lipa, I have the picture of her crying when all these people started being arrested in her, um, in, during her performance. Um, she has said that, uh, well, there are videos of it. She said that she was horrified by the incident and spoke to her fans, I will stand by you all for your love and beliefs, and I am proud and grateful that you felt safe enough to show your pride at my show. What you did takes a lot of bravery. I always want my music to bring strength, hope, and unity. I was horrified by what happened, and I send love to all my fans involved. She's 23. She's been vocal in her support for LGBT community rights, and, um, to return to China, although homosexuality is not illegal, the country de decriminalized it in 1997, and LGBT visibility has increased. There's been creeping cultural censorship since Xi Jinping came to power in November 2012. In November 2017, Human Rights Watch interviewed 17 Chinese LGBT people who said they'd been pressured into undergoing conversion therapy. But and a good um, thing happening in the entertainment industry in China is that Kinky Boots is being shown. And, you know, <laughs> yes. We liked Kinky Boots. We did. Um, <laughs> it encourages drag queens to be themselves. <laughs> Uh, it's an award-winning musical. It's broken new ground in conservative China. It's filled theaters in Beijing, <laughs> Shanghai, and Guangzhou, lighting up audiences in the country where, where LGBT entertainment is often, often censored and rarely, rarely gets major, if any, billing. It reached a broader audience than usual in China because it was the first musical to offer sign language. Interpreters oh. for the 
the hearing impaired um, enact the show. Um, a deaf person um, reports that subtitles heretofore had only been available in the theater, but now I've got access to the whole show, he said. Uh, they memorized the show, never looked back during the performance. Um, as we know, uh, Kinky Boots, whose music and lyrics were written by pop singer Cindy Lauper, wraps up its two-month China tour. Um, it is, uh, involves a drag queen who saves a shoe factory um, and comes out to his father. It's very, uh, very moving. Uh, gay themed films struggle to make it into movie theaters in China and gay content is forbidden online and online streaming platforms. Oscar winning Call Me By Your Name was uh, pulled from the Beijing International Fil Film Festival in March. Another film about a secret homosexual relationship looking for Romer was heavily edited for Chinese move, movie theaters. The game theme dance uh, has been banned from the broadcast of Eurovision in May. Kinky Boots, the shoe factory worker, saves the business by teaming up with a drag queen named Lola who <laughs> wanted red thigh-high stiletto boots and wore them. Yes. Um, Lola, she was a showgirl. Yeah. <laughs> I have some pictures to show you in case I'm running out of time. Yes. <laughs> um, Belgrade Gay Pride participants call for a law on same-sex marriage, and I have a picture of the Prime Minister, the lesbian Prime Minister, Anna Br Brnovic. She's in the center of the picture. Her partner is with her. The mayor of Belgrade were there. Uh, they didn't want her to come because they felt she hadn't done enough, but she joined the Pride Festival and all went well. Romania will hold a referendum on changes to the Constitution that could effectively uh, prevent gay marriage. That vote is going to be on October 7th. They didn't want to happen. it to happen. It's a step backward, but I'll report on that. The gay activist in the Greek capital of Athens was, uh, I have a picture of him before he died. Uh, he was lynched by a mob. Ouch. Yeah, he uh, fled to a jewelry store uh, where he was lynched and he tried to, it's kind of unclear what happened, but he tried to, he got a fire extinguish, extinguisher and tried to crawl out of the shop and there's, um, there are pictures of him being kicked and beaten to death. When he got to the street, somebody tried to help him. When the ambulance came, he died on the way to the hospital. His name was Zach Kostopoulos. He was 33 and a gay and HIV activist. My final <laughs> picture for you is of the Queen's cousin who's marrying his new husband, in fact did. James Coyle was, is his name. Um, Ivar was given away by his um, ex-wife. Yes. <laughs> Lady Penny Mountbatten um, is her name, and she and James Coyle, he's on the left. Um, Ivor Mountbatten is on the right, and Penny is in the middle. <laughs> this is a picture of them at the wedding ceremony. 60, 60 people attended, including their three proud daughters. How Lord. liberal. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, that's the royal news yeah. for How this British. evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this story I found kind of interesting. Um, mostly because, well, it takes place in Lafayette, Louisiana. And Christians there are uh, claiming they're second class citizens. Two angry Christians? Christians? Yes. Two angry Christian groups have filed suit in Lafayette and the governor and the library. Chris Sevier and others filed on behalf of the Warriors of Christ. Drag queen when story news hour. broke that. Drag queens were coming to the local library. The mayor said he would do whatever it would take to stop this from happening. And this is the really kind of interesting part. The lawsuit claims that LGBTQ messaging is part of a religion called secular humanism. Oh, please. Oh, <laughs> 
secular humanism. I know. That's going to get her going for an entire other show. <laughs> I, you know it. I have strong I, views. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's this love story. I have a photo of Haley Vitticus and Leanna White. And what happened was they were pioneer pla uh, plaintiffs in the process that changed the country. They were two young women who played for Pepperdine which as we know has some affiliation with the Church of Christ. And um, they fell in love and they're expecting a child now. And um, there's also a, um, a movie coming out about them. So I think we should all watch for that. Um, they were really afraid of uh, retaliation. They filed suit against the school. They did lose the case. Um, but the court did say that sexual orientation was covered by Title IX. Um, and their last statement was, they're now both intend to go to law school and become lawyers and fight for LGBTQ causes. So Venue for the movie? We, what's the name for the, of the yeah. movie? Um, it is called... I... I'll get yeah. back to you on the next well, show. Yes, I have it here somewhere, but we're running out of time, so I should probably, um, it's called, I think it's a, they're an interracial couple. Oh, it's called Alone in the Game. Oh. So, well, theater, or, Netflix. I think it's going to be, it's a documentary. I would think it would probably be on Netflix. I'm not Amazon sure. They Prime. didn't say in the article I read, but um, it looks to be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, watch now, for it. So. And, now, and now we've got an interview. Yeah. That Ann did. Yeah. Do you want to introduce it? I kind do. Kind of inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> it is very inspiring. Um, it was with Rachel Siegel and Beverly Little Thunder of the Peace and Justice Center. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm here with Rachel Siegel and Better Beverly Little Thunder from the Peace and Justice Center. I'm very pleased you're be, you're going to be able to join us to talk a little bit about thanks for having us. What you've been Thank up you. to? Thank you. Well, let's start if we could with a little bit about the Peace and Justice Center. What's the history? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of offerings does it, do they provide? And how long have you been involved with them? Okay. Rachel's the ED. Right. Yeah, so you want me to take this and yeah, then you can you you fill it. in the gaps that I missed. Yeah. So the Peace and Justice Center formed almost 40 years ago as a peace coalition that was doing anti-nuclear proliferation work and um, is now a statewide membership-based nonprofit organization. And the programs have changed and morphed over the years. We have three main program areas that we do educational work and campaigns around. They are racial justice nonviolence, and fair trade. And then in addition to those three focus areas, we also support a lot of other individuals and activist groups around the state. And we do that in, in many ways. Like most recently there was an Let Equality Bloom activist festival just a couple the days other ago. Day, I'm in sure. Burlington that Vermont Women's March put on and they needed insurance for the space they were using. So we provided insurance for them or there was the Race Against Racism and they had a press release they wanted to send out and so we sent it to our media contact list which is 135 people. So like because we've been around long enough we have a lot of infrastructure that we can share and help uplift other people's work. So a lot of what we do is acting as a resource or a hub for other people who are doing work that's aligned with what, what we're about. And we have a lot of volunteers and interns who we work with and it's a lot more than sort of the standard you work for us for free and we'll give you mm -hmm. something for your resume model. It's much more about actualizing these individuals. We have students as young as middle school who come and spend regular hours with us learning, um, this, getting the skills and the motivation to you know, be activists for life. It's really, it's one of the most gratifying things is seeing the, the people who come through as volunteers and interns who leave with so much more passion and commitment than they came with. And you've been the ED for five years? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And you were on the city council before that? I, read, I was, and I they overlapped for a little bit. Did they? Yeah. And you decided not to pursue the political career and focus yeah. more on grassroots mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Oh. Beverly, how long have you been involved, and what's your, you know, what's your well, job title? Well, I'm actually on, on the board. Oh, good. Uh, I've been on the board for a little over four years. Mm -hmm. And um, for a while, I did serve as uh, board chair mm -hmm. and step back from that and um, I've been involved in in a lot of different aspects we have a working board we don't just meet once a month to rubber stamp things that Rachel puts in front of us <laughs> um, we show up for volunteering at tables we show up to help uh, do presentations uh, we show up to address and uh, stamp newsletters that are going to go out. Um, we cook chili for our annual <laughs> uh, fundraiser. Yeah. We do it all. We do it all. How many board members are there and do you have fixed terms or? There are nine board members currently and a couple of people who are poised to join the board. Mm -hmm. They're two-year terms and people can be re-elected. I've been re-elected, obviously. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, could you tell us, both of you, how your identity affects your involvement with the Peace and Justice Center and your leadership uh, in the state? Sure, I can try to do that. And I think that you're talking about mostly our gender and sexual mm -hmm. orientation in terms of those aspects of our identity. Mm -hmm. Um, so I identify as being part of the queer community. I identify as queer. used to call myself bisexual. Um, I'm in a long-term relationship with a man, so I'm in that funny world of queerness where I pass most of the time, unless I like advertise who my past relationships were with, which is just kind of a weird thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you know, my kids know, my family knows, my close friends know. Two kids? Yeah. It's very much a part of my identity, um, except for people who don't know me. So it's, it's a funny thing to be part of a community, but be sort of have all the, the benefits of not being part of it. Mm -hmm. And it was a very strange transition for me, going from my previous relationship, which was with a woman, into this one. And just realizing that even in Burlington, Vermont, where I live, where it's, you know, pretty accepting a lot of the time to like walk down the street holding hands with a same-sex partner that then walking down the street holding hands with an opposite sex partner was so much easier like mm -hmm. my level like I didn't even know I would be anxious holding her hand but then when I was holding his hand I could t then I could tell that my anxiety level was lower so I'm way off topic here but just so I called myself bisexual for a long time I mostly call myself part of the queer community now and mm -hmm. My kid has come out as non-binary and pansexual, and I had never heard of pansexual. Is that the person who's, who was in the action, who was on TV? No, my daughter, who was arrested with me, is um, a girl, and my other kid is non-binary. How old are they? Um, they are 12. My daughter's 14, and my other kid is 12. And so... When they came out as pan, I realized, like, oh, I'm probably pan. You know, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't only, I wouldn't rule out somebody who's not male or female. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being bisexual means, like, I could choose between two. But really, I could choose between this whole spectrum. Exactly. So I suppose I'm, pro I'm pan, too, and I have my kid to thank for that. Well, we're all <laughs> learning a lot from the youth. Oh, I yeah. Would agree. yeah. Yeah. So in terms of how it impacts my leadership, I mean, I think sort of, uh, it just adds to my understanding of experiences of oppression. I mm -hmm. think having, having been in same-sex relationships and experiencing the, the violence that can come our way and the lack of access that could come your way, and less so now that you know marriage is legalized, mm -hmm. but it doesn't solve all the problems. No, it um, does not. But I think that in a lot of ways my gender informs my leadership more than my sexuality. Mm -hmm. that, that being female and being feminist has informed a lot of 
how I do decision making and how I lead the organization, which is very much of a collaborative way of doing it. It's very unusual for me to make a decision in a bubble, and certainly not a decision that's going to really upset the rest of the staff. Like, if there's a controversy in staff, like, should we do it this way or this way or this way, I usually will say, okay, well, it's going to impact so-and-so the most, so we should do what that person mm -hmm. thinks is mm -hmm. best. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that that's more of a, an egalitarian kind of feminist framework than the top-down patriarchal way mm -hmm. of doing things. Beverly, do you want to say anything on this topic about how your identity informs your leadership or your activism? Or well, I think I was born an activist. Mm -hmm. you know, as a as a as a Native woman, uh, I've always had to be an activist. Uh, when I came out, um, I didn't even know the words lesbian and gay, so it was totally new for me. So it was learning a whole new language is. Again, learning a whole new <laughs> language. Uh, in the Native community, we consider ourselves two-spirited. Mm -hmm. And so I've been very active in the two-spirit community. And in coming on to the board for you know, the Peace and Justice uh, Center, uh, it was just another step, another role. Uh, not being from Vermont, uh, initially, my tribe is from South Dakota, North Dakota, mm -hmm. so I'm not Abenaki. Um, I felt like it was important to learn what the political atmosphere was here and to be able to plug into the areas where they might need help in promoting uh, who they were. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I came in just about the time that uh, the Abenaki were uh, struggling to get state recognition. And so I was very drawn to the board. We have a, um, we made a decision that the board would be 50% people of color. Minimum. Minimum. And um, we really strive to do that. And so all voices are heard. And so I felt very comfortable being in, in that kind of an environment in, in doing social justice work. And of course, the anti-racism work is something that just comes uh, natural to me. It's something that I've, I've had to deal with all my life and will probably have to continue dealing with, uh, especially in Vermont, mm -hmm. especially in mm -hmm. Vermont. Yeah. Um, speaking of activism and actions, you and your daughter were um, appeared on WCAX and you were arrested recently. Would you mind sure. telling us a little about that? Yeah, we, um, we were part of a group of people that organized a protest in Williston outside the ICE offices on July 28th and 13 of us were arrested blocking traffic. We got disorderly <laughs> conduct charges. Uh, two of those arrested were minors. One of them was 16 and one of them was 14, who's my daughter. And it was a very powerful experience for us. I mean, the, and it's not about us. I mean, the situation is so atrocious and there's still hundreds of kids who are separated from their families and there's still, you know, all the people who've been, re, who've been deported and they, there's no way to find them anymore. And the, the kids are not gonna be with their parents again. And to discover that this office was in Winooski. Williston. You know. Williston, that's yeah, right, yeah. you know, right in our midst. Yeah, it was appalling. Yeah. Not that, you know, as citizens of the U.S., we don't bear responsibility, right. but that was shocking. Yeah, no, very local. It's the hotline center, so uh -huh. if you have a tip, if you think somebody's looking shady and you call and you're right. like, check their immigration status, the call, wherever, if you're calling from Arizona, the call comes in in Vermont, mm -hmm. wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So we had a great opportunity with the Pride Parade. We weren't going to march in it, the Peace it was and the Justice LGBT Center. the LGBT Pride Parade that happened last weekend. Yeah, a couple weekends ago in Vermont. Um, a Peace and Justice Center member contacted us and said, hey, I want to help you since you're doing all this work toward the Abolish ICE movement and for family unification. Let's get a group of people together and make some signs. And they ended up making these beautiful butterfly wings that you could wear that said things like, um, you know, support trans migrants and migrant rights are um, gay rights and just all this intersectional stuff. And we weren't necessarily gonna march in the parade, but since she helped get a whole lot of volunteers together to do it, 
we were able to, and I think Beverly will mention there was a controversy also around TD Bank with Pride, and so we brought a message about boycotting TD Bank, and we had signs about abolish ICE and boycott TD, and we were right near the front, and there were like 15 of us, and we were chanting, um, what were we saying, queer rights, migrant rights, uh, what's it called, same struggle, same fight, and uh -huh. it was powerful, and the people packed, you know, lined up and down Church Street for four whole blocks were like with us, and it felt so good to be able to celebrate mm -hmm. pride while also bringing a political message and saying, don't forget, things are not great, like have a fun day and stay active. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was um, grand, one of the grand marshals for, for the pride parade, and um, when I found out that TD Bank was funding some of the pride and pride parade and that the board was not willing to return that money to TD I had a choice of whether I was going to continue as Grand Marshal or withdraw and I decided that I wanted to continue as Grand Marshal only this time I carried a sign that says divest from TD Bank mm -hmm. and in my speech I talked about how as marginalized groups we need to investigate the organizations that were asking for money because I don't want to take money from um, an organization that is oppressing say peace and justice mm -hmm. I you know I, I want to support peace and justice as they want to support Native American rights and TD Bank was a large funder in uh, the pipeline in North Dakota South Dakota at Standing Rock which happens to be the reservation I'm from. Mm -hmm. And as you know, that black snake went through, thanks to Trump, and has sprung three leaks already. And um, it's a fight that's going on all over the country. And Standing Rock is just the pebble in a still pond. And so I had to, I had to bring that up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was very, very, proud of peace and justice for leading the march and of course I kind of encouraged it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah we did ask. <laughs> it's like what do you think Grand Marshal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay we're getting to the close of our interview believe it or not. Um, do you have any last words or concluding remarks you'd like to share with us? I just hope that people stay involved that we're mm -hmm. heading up to the midterm elections that hopefully things are going to go in the way that most of us on the left think as good, mm -hmm. but that we shouldn't get complacent. No. That when there's Democrats in office, things aren't great. Yeah. Good point. And that everyone can be active in different ways. There's lots to do. Yeah. And I would like to see more of the Abenaki um, population become more active and not be so afraid of being defunded by TD Bank or being having their status taken away by the state of Vermont. Because mm -hmm. that seems to be something I hear a lot of. Well, thank you very much for coming thank in. I you. hope each of you will come back in separate interviews or together, whatever. Thanks again. Okay, there, there was entirely too much to be discussed, so. Too little time. We are booking them already, right? Yes. Okay. Maybe we should extend our interview times. Oh, um, well, we That's can. a longer conversation. I know. Yes. <laughs> Because we so, have such fascinating people on. I know, and you just you know, get going, I mean, really. You just get started. And, and we're also becoming more comfortable with the format and yeah. interviewing, and we're looking at more expanded questions. So, yeah. All right. So, a little trivia. Yes. Do you think you know the answer? No. Abortion. No. Legalizing same sex relations. No, but. There's a sidebar to that. October 1986, Vermont Republican Party Platform Committee removes an initiative. What they removed was the Equal Rights Amendment oh. to Vermont's Constitution. Here were their arguments. They wanted an alternative statement using equal protection instead of equal rights. <gasps> and they wanted to replex, replace sex with gender to make it clear that the party platform does not include support of gay rights. Oh. The initiative went out for vote for ratification and it was defeated. 
51% to 49%. The two prevailing issues during the campaign, non-gender specific bathrooms and marriage equality. Huh. So with that. Are we leaving? I think so. Okay. We have places to go. We it's do. It's time. Okay. Dinner awaits. So I think we should all hold our fingers about Kavanaugh and hope fingers that he, crossed that that he doesn't get appointed, although Confirmed. it doesn't look good. Yeah. Um, so on that note, even if he does, we have to continue to resist. <laughs>